thank you so much for joining us today, Professor. We're really, really excited to speak with you. You do such yeah. awesome uh, work. So you've done really cool work on visual question and answering, VQA, uh, and recently released a, a fascinating paper, um, a new model, CRISP, that kind of leverages symbolic knowledge with kind of existing framework. Could you talk a bit about your work there? Um, how do you see neurosymbolic AI for visual question answering, if at all, um, and how it fits with current work? Yeah, yeah, happy to talk about that a little bit. Um, and so the idea there was that you can sort of um, there is a lot of knowledge you can learn just by um, reading text that just might be out there, whether it's on the web and things like that. Um, so for example, even if you look at just children's stories, the fact that dogs bark is probably something that you can pick up on if you just read a whole lot of these stories. But then there is other sorts of knowledge that is just not usually explicitly written down. So the fact that um, penguins can't fly or the fact that Chardonnay is a kind of wine like that explicit statement um, is unlikely to be there um, in, uh, in text that you might just find on the web. Um, but this information is there in more structured knowledge graphs that people have built over the years using either automated tools or even people typing it in. Um, and so it seems like it's useful to find ways to combine knowledge that's present in both of these sources. Um, and sort of typically with a lot of the deep learning models that we've used in the supervised learning fashion, we do a good job of um, extracting the knowledge that's just present in these large core prof texts that might be on the web, but we haven't quite done as well in terms of figuring out how to include this more sort of symbolic structured knowledge that might exist in these knowledge bases. And so this paper is one attempt at trying to include both um, in trying to do visual question answering and we, we can we show that it helps if you're using both sources of information. Um, in terms of sort of neurosymbolic approaches and things like that, I don't tend to think about it too much as neural approaches versus symbolic approaches and things like that. I think I tend to think more about the fact that there are these different sources of information and we should be trying to find ways to leverage both. Now, whether those are just neural architectures that can leverage both or whether you need a different kind of architecture to leverage both, that I feel like is more an empirical question that the field will figure out over time. Um, but I tend to focus on the fact that we do want to use these different sources of knowledge and whatever is the most effective way of doing that um, seems fine to me. Interesting, that's an interesting framing of kind of not breaking it down into neural and symbolic. Uh, so kind of shifting gears, you also do fascinating work on at kind of at the intersection of AI and creativity. Uh, and I, I played around with your doodle GAN um, online, which we'll add, uh, it's awesome. Could you talk a bit about your work uh, there? Sure, sure. So in, in that project, um, we were interested in um, trying to see if we can build tools, machine learning tools that can um, generate these more uh, creative sketches as opposed to sort of more just mundane realistic depictions of objects that we might see. Um, and, and we were also interested in seeing if these tools can be something that a person can work in collaboration with, that if I'm trying to sketch, can this tool help me um, sketch better. Um, and so one maybe surprising thing that we found when we started the project was that a lot of the sketch data sets that existed were more of these sort of mundane, just realistic depictions of objects as they exist in the real world. Um, whereas I would have thought that a lot of people are interested in these more sort of fantastical depictions of whether it's birds or animals and other forms of creatures. Um, but we didn't come across any data set that had that um, and so we started by uh, collecting that data set. So we had people um, engage in this creative exercise. We would give them a random initial stroke. We would tell them to draw an eye wherever they want. And then we would ask people to step back and think about, okay, how can I use this random stroke? And how can I use this arbitrary eye to now create a bird or an animal or some other creature? Um, and so because people were involved in this creative exercise while collecting these sketches, um, we now have this data set of these fantastical depictions of these these creative depictions of sketches. And then we train this uh, part-based GAN model that um, starting with this initial stroke, it first decides where it should draw the eye. Then it tries to decide which part it should draw next and where that part should be and what it should look like. And sort of sequentially, it then completes the whole sketch. Um, and what's nice about the setup is that you as a human can now come in and draw some of the parts. So if you feel like you want to decide where the eye is, then you can draw the eye and the model will then decide where the next part should be. And so you can have this nice natural 
collaborative sort of back and forth where you would also draw some of the parts, the model will draw some of the parts and whatever you draw, the model is going to try and adapt. It might not always do a great job, but it's meant to set up to adapt to the choices that you made and then complete the sketch from there. And so it is, like you mentioned, it is a fun demo to play with. Um, so yeah. yeah, I enjoyed creating some monsters and crazy creatures. It's definitely <laughs> very cool, very yeah. inspiring. Yeah. I guess I know you do some art yourself as well, or how has kind of your art informed your work in computer science and these kinds of projects? Yeah, I, I don't know, to be honest, if it has um, had any sort of a very explicit or a conscious um, influence. I'm sure there probably is sort of a latent influence because it is just me and so one part of my brain probably influences the other kind of thing. Um, but I don't think I can identify a very direct connection. I have done a couple of sort of small projects in computational creativity that was using some of my art as the underlying thing that we were studying. Um, so I have, I've, I've done some things at that intersection, but I don't know if sort of my research agenda has been influenced significantly by what I've done with my, in sort of the art side of things so far. It would be neat if it does. I would, I would like that to be true. I would like to have a more interesting answer to this question, but I don't think I'm there yet. Interesting. Um, and kind of what projects in AI and creativity most excite you going forward? Um, I think I've, I've dabbled in a bunch of spaces like with sketching and we've also done some things with sort of movement synchronizing with music. So that looks sort of gives you a perception of dance um, and various other things like that. I think I'm not quite, I don't think there's a particular domain that I'm excited about more than others. But I think the core thing that I'm excited about is this potential for machines to provide creative inspiration to humans. So by, by interacting with a machine, if a person ends up producing something that they are more excited about, or even if the final output isn't more exciting in any way, but just the process, the creative process was more engaging and more fun, I would, I would call that success. And you mentioned it a little bit on the limitations of data sets uh, with your sketch project, but kind of broadly within AI for creativity and uh, the, your, your VQA work, what are some of the biggest outstanding challenges you have? Is it on the algorithm side, hardware side, data set side, implementation, like a mix of everything? Um, yeah, I think, I, think it's, I think it is a mix of everything um, to quite an extent. And I think on the creativity side, some of the additional challenges um, are things like evaluation that there isn't a well agreed upon definition of what it means for something to be creative or um, what creativity means. And then trying to, so given the fact that there isn't even a definition, the effort of trying to have some evaluation protocol and some evaluation metrics that you can use to measure progress um, is just hard right now. And there is no agreement on or consensus on what that should be. So I think that tends to be a challenge where um, on any project that we are working on, we can try and identify the things that we care about and we can design human studies or other ways of measuring that. But as a community, we kind of tend to sometimes talk past each other um, because there isn't sort of a proper agreed upon definition of what it means for something to be creative. So I think some of those questions are um, unique to this space. And I think if we want to sort of have a more systematic way of doing these things going forward, um, some agreement on that would be nice, um, but that's probably gonna be a challenge. Um, there are other questions like, what does it mean for a machine to be creative? Can a machine even be creative? Um, and things of that sort. And various people have interesting opinions on this. Um, I personally, at least so far, haven't thought of those as the primary questions. I feel like if we can build a tool that helps a person be more creative, I feel like that's sufficient. I don't feel the need to answer the question of, so is that machine creative or not? Um, but it's possible that I'll change my mind later and somehow those questions would become more central as we keep going. It's fascinating to kind of think about those different questions. I guess a little bit off topic, but what kind of fields do you look to beyond work in computer science? Do any other fields inspire you in your work of, kind of cognitive science or, or philosophy related to that? Or is it more a very kind of in engineering focus? Um, I think for the most part, it has been engineering focused. Um, I have recently started reading more about sort of the philosophy of creativity and things like that because of what I was just describing earlier to see if there is um, some way for me to at least personally find, find a framework to think about these things, even if there isn't consensus in the community on this. Um, another thing is that I've also been involved um, in a project um, on electrocatalysis. 
where the idea is to try and see if we can use machine learning um, as a way of identifying um, materials that would prove to be good catalysts um, for various reactions that would be useful for storing energy, basically, with the ultimate goal being if we can find something amazing, it would help with things like climate change and so on. Um, and so there I've ended up dabbling a little bit in um, the science of it and things like that. Um, I'm nowhere near being an expert and we're working very closely with um, domain experts who have much of this knowledge um, and we rely on them for that. Um, but that's been maybe one other avenue where I've um, explored a little bit out of sort of just core computer science or core engineering. Cool, and uh, kind of shifting gears a little bit further, could you talk a little bit about your trajectory? How did you get into machine learning? Um, yeah, so this was, um, I think, in the third year of my undergrad, so junior year, um, where in my, I went to a small school in uh, Southern New Jersey called Rowan University. Um, and so there, uh, a big part of the undergraduate program was these uh, semester uh, projects that they called engineering clinics. Um, and so you could, this was all through the four years. And so you could sign up for a variety of projects for that. Some of those could be research projects, but others were also sort of non-research, sort of more core application oriented engineering projects. Um, and so in my third year, I had, uh, I, I, I had decided that I really like computer architecture. And so I had signed up for um, various computer architecture projects for my clinic project. Um, but that year, um, there was a new faculty who joined, Dr. Roby Polikar, um, who was working in what at the time was called pattern recognition. This was an EC department. I wasn't even in CS. Um, and so it was called pattern recognition. Um, and he was new. And so he didn't have students. Students didn't know him and things like that. Um, and so he was looking for students to get involved in his projects. And um, he identified me as someone that he would be interested in working with. And so he pitched this project to me. It sounded interesting. Um, and I did it and I loved it. I did that for the next two years in my undergrad. And that was the seed for applying to grad school and everything else sort of just came from there. But I think that's, was, that was the shift for me where I got introduced to pattern recognition or machine learning and continued from there. Awesome. Uh, and kind of, you also do work in industry, a research scientist at, at Facebook AI and also professor. So can you talk a little about how you've kind of titrated between those domains? I know we get a lot as students, undergrads uh, and grad students kind of thinking about whether to go to academia or industry, if they're very binary, a uh, few thoughts there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for me, there isn't all that. So the high level bits of what I do are quite similar at both places. Um, because FAIR, uh, the team that I'm in, Facebook AI Research, does a lot of basic open fundamental research. We write papers about it and publish it and open source the code. Um, and so I'm not very tied to, I'm not tied to like specific products or things like that. Um, so a lot of the work that I do has similar flavors. Um, there, is, there is some difference in that um, Facebook has more computational resources than my lab at Georgia Tech does. Um, even though for academic labs, I think we have a pretty good setup in terms of our computational cluster, um, but it's, it's obviously not at the level of uh, something that Facebook can provide. And so there are certain projects that are um, easier to take on or might even just be infeasible um, at, at, at my, in my lab um, that I can do at, at Facebook. Um, and so I think that's one um, that's one distinction that I can think of for sure. Another distinction is that some projects often need um, a strong sort of heavy engineering investment. For example, I'm collaborating with um, a project where uh, the team had built a 3D simulator of sort of photorealistic environments so that agents simulated robots can navigate through these indoor spaces like homes and things like that. Um, and so that has sort of a very heavy upfront engineering effort which might not make a lot of sense for a PhD student to take on to spend a whole year um, implementing a simulator before they can even get started on research. So some of those things I think can be complementary. And because we open source everything, so the simulator that was built at FAIR is open source that anybody can use. And so not just my lab at Georgia Tech, but other academics as well. Um, and so there can be this sort of nice synergy um, um, between, between the two setups um, that I think I enjoy. Another student question um, is for students that are interested in getting into machine learning, just kind of whether you start on the applied side or more on the theoretical side or kind of a mix of both. Do you have any thoughts there or advice to students on how to get their feet kind of into the into the field? Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, 
I think you do need both at some level. Um, and I think where you start, I think it should just depend on what you tend to get excited about, right? So if you are the kind of person that really enjoys taking a piece of code and just starting to tinker with it and see what it does, then maybe starting on the applied side. Um, and then once you're sufficiently excited and you know you like this, um, also getting the more systematic formal background in that. Um, versus if you're the kind of person where you feel like, no, I want to start from scratch. I want chapter one of machine learning 101 and I want to sort of proceed in a very systematic way. Then it might also make sense to sort of start with a more theoretical background and follow a course. And there might be assignments where you get to tinker with things and get your hands dirty. Um, so I would say just whatever it is that excites you um, to get started, I feel like that's a good first step. Um, but I do think you eventually want a good balance between both. You don't want just one or the other. And kind of final question, do you have any broad advice or general advice that you like to give students that you like to give students now? Um, I don't tend to have a lot of profound advice, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I just think that if you're interested in this space, um, just jump right in, right? I think this is a fascinating space. At some level, it is about understanding intelligence, which is sort of central to what makes humans unique in the known universe, at least so far. Um, and so there's a lot to be done. There is There are a lot of applications. AI is starting to have real world impact already. There's likely much more impact it will have going forward. Um, so the more minds we have, the more different kinds of minds we have, um, people who are looking at the technical problems in different ways or looking at the world and the societal impact in different ways. Um, we need all of these people. We need all of these perspectives. Um, so just sort of jump right in and welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you, that's great advice. I also love your post on uh, time management uh, and using calendars, so we'll add that. Um, I thought that's really cool to think about. Yeah, so that great. yeah, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to speak with us. It was really exciting to hear about your work uh, and amazing career so far. So thank <laughs> you so much. And thanks thank for you. doing this. Thank you.